的，就是说你知道吗？好多都是吗？说的，但是这个就是那个那个，这个我想那个，我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我我
in kind of a, um, a nod or a loose reference to their dad who was in the CIA, suddenly hearing the name of Miles Copeland took me back to my childhood. I really didn't, I haven't spent much time thinking about it, but Miles Copeland and my father were really close friends and, and partners in the Middle East where I was born. So being that it was 2003, I came home and quickly like Googled, Googled my dad. I never thought to look for him on the internet. I really didn't think about my dad much at all. So I found a book and ordered it. And uh, when it came, I, you know, I tried to read it, but it was so incomprehensible to me. It was like, what am I diving into? The, the history was so complex. It was written by, uh, it was called Ropes of Sand, written by another CIA agent. And so I, I just had to put it down because at the time, my career, which I had just kind of fallen into a couple of years earlier, promoting alternative fuels, really anything but oil, trying to work to have large fleets use less oil, was just like starting to take off. And so I was pretty obsessed with my job. And I also had two uh, teenagers still at home. So I put it on the back burner for about seven years and picked it back up in 2010. But that's where the germ came from. And can you tell us a little bit about how much your father was in your life? Really growing up, my father was pretty absent in after I was six years old. He suddenly left, you know, from my mother's perspective, and I guess mine, but I don't remember any of it, uh, left our family when I was six years old. And I thought it would be good for folks that haven't read the book yet, maybe to get a little introduction by reading a little sure. portion of that. Kind of sets the stage for what I was uh, really uh, up against in, uh, in trying to you know, get to know my father so many, so many years after he died. He died in 1989. So where is this? Okay, here it is. It's, from, it's early on in the book. My father left us in 1960. He had a long-term relationship with another woman, Patsy Cooper, though they never married. Ike continued to be a consultant, living overseas, jetting around the world until 1967 or so, when he and Patsy settled in Laurel, Maryland, an hour's drive from where I lived with my mother and my brother. After Patsy died, my father moved even closer than that, into subsidized housing for the elderly in DC. I have letters from him, 12 to be exact, beginning in 1982 and spanning six years. There was another, but I believe I destroyed it because of how cruelly he wrote about my mother. In most of his letters, he writes about his draft autobiography, how he's up to 500 pages, how he'll be sure to get me a copy. I never got one. In his last letter, he suggests meeting me in London or Paris and informs me how he and Miles Copeland have been talking about writing a book on covert political action. This is right after telling me that he has cancer, which has spread to his lungs, but has been successfully treated by, quote, with nothing to prevent me from living the good life that all sinful old men are entitled to. He died three months later. What happened to this part of me who once had so much, then lost it all? I know he was a proud man, a brilliant man, a man with an ironic sense of humor, a lover of poetry and flights of fancy, but there is so much more I don't know. Thank you. I think one aspect of this book that really drew me in was this longing for a lost father um, because I have my own lost father. I think many of us have lost fathers for different reasons. And I was struck by the intensity of your commitment to search for him. Once that arose in you, it seemed uh, so powerful. And I wonder what you were most hoping to find on this journey. I really, I guess in essence, wanted to better understand what made my father and what broke him. Really, I, I didn't think about my father very much growing up. You can ask my husband for years. I mean, we've been married 43 years. 
and early on, I, I mean, it, it just wasn't a part of my life. And it wasn't until I started this career in 2003 and became really sensitive, you know, about getting us off of oil, kind of became interested in the subject of like our oil addiction and where did it all start? And what did, you know, my life, my early childhood have to do with that? And that kind of really opened the door of my curiosity about my father. Uh, because I knew, I mean, I was born in, in, the, in Cairo, Egypt, and we lived in Beirut, Lebanon, and I kind of knew the kind of the, the uh, loose sketches of, 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 you know, of my father, but other than that, I didn't know anything. And so the internet opened it all up for me, and, and the timing. So there's a lot of twists and turns in what you discover about your father, and I really appreciate the um, weaving together of the personal and the political and all the characters that you encountered along the way. And I wonder, what was your most surprising discovery uh, on the journey of writing this book? I think the most surprising discovery really were the people that I, well, I didn't really meet them, but I looked to them as guides because they helped me so much. I wouldn't have been able to write this book if these people didn't appear in my life. Ranging from a Palestinian author, Saeed Aborish, whom I, I've only met one of these six or seven guides. So Saeed Aborish was my first one. And then there was a, a fellow that was like a day trader or something, and uh, his name was Dan Egan, and he also was a really big Middle East history affectionado. And he just, seemed to be connected with all these other people and uh, really opened a lot of doors for me. And I thought, I guess, to also orient the folks that haven't read the book yet to, to one of these guides that I could maybe read a little bit uh, about uh, Jerry Davis, who, who was a, a filmmaker who contacted me through um, Dan Egan, and Dan Egan had referred him uh, to me. And so this is what I have to say. By way of our introductory phone conversation, I learned the filmmaker, who goes by the name Jerry, is a retired healthcare and marketing executive. His voice is warm and friendly as we talk over the landline connecting our family room to his home in Columbia, South Carolina. I imagine he's about my age. Jerry helped coin the phrase, I can't believe it's not butter, for a popular margarine ad in the early 1980s. Now he's on a quest to document the life of one of his mentors, Frank Kearns, who had a lauded career as a foreign correspondent for CBS, was Jerry's journalism professor at West Virginia University. During World War II, my father and Kearns were flatmates with Miles Copeland in London. And the three friends and their wives socialized when we were all based in Cairo. Seven years ago, Jerry met Kearns' widow at a press awards dinner when she offered him her late husband's personal papers, a full seven boxes, if he'd take on the project of telling his story. The filmmaker tells me he's in the final production stages of the documentary and would be most grateful for any visuals I could provide of my father or Frank during the war or when we lived in Cairo. I don't have much. I didn't know my father very well growing up, but I'll see what I can find. I replied before asking him to tell me more about the film. He's happy to oblige. When Frank first came to Egypt, he was a freelance reporter, what's called a stringer for CBS. Kearns' stature grew and he became CBS's African bureau chief, a man who embedded with troops and inter interviewed leaders in conflict-torn countries like Algeria and Egypt. According to Jerry, Frank Frank faced death 114 times before he stopped counting. To tell him how impressed I am with Frank's bravery and the years of work he's devoted to making the film and writing a forthcoming book about his mentor. Really? I'm grappling with just one question in my film, Jerry responds. Was Frank Kearns working for the CIA at the time he was working for CBS? There is no direct evidence. His close relationships with Miles Copeland and your father are the only circumstantial indicators. It's a mystery then, I say. Not according to CBS, Jerry tells me. During the 1975 Congressional Committee hearings on intelligence activities led by Senator Frank Church, 
He explains that the then former president of CBS outed Kearns as also working for the CIA. It's a charge Kearns vehemently denied to his death 11 years later. How sad, I think, that after so much success in his career, Frank's purported association with the CIA would haunt the rest of his life and tarnish his legacy. Jerry's story has me pause to consider the stakes for my father and his own relationship with the CIA. How difficult it must have been for those in a profession looked upon by others with such contempt, as if the work were shameful, something to be vociferously denied under inquiry. What secrets did Ike carry to his grave? Perhaps it's not so far-fetched to think the CIA could have buried his book manuscript, the manuscript my father was working on, thereby keeping its potential revelation secret. Ike likely would have known if Kearns was on the CIA payroll. In one of his letters, my father told me he was writing about everyone he had known in his whole life. An addictive exercise that was intoxicating and a reflection that occupied his last years. I am panged by not having this manuscript now. There definitely was a lot of regret that my, I didn't ever get my dad's manuscript that he promised me. Mm. Mm. Hearing what you just read makes me also think of a, a passage in the book where you confess that the, the question, the real driving question for you is what breaks a man? And I wonder um, a couple of things. I wonder how you concluded that your father was broken and if you ever got an answer to that question that satisfied you. Well, I, I surmise that he was broken because my dad had so much promise in his life. I mean, uh, he was you know, riding high and he died a penniless alcoholic. He lived in subsidized housing. I only saw my father really, you know, toward the latter years of his life. So that's that made a big impression on me that he was living in subsidized housing, and uh, and then you know comparing that with what I, the little bit I knew about him, and certainly the jet-setting life that he led as a diplomat, I guess that was really working for the CIA, and then also as an oil industry consultant, very different than the way he ended up. So I don't think anybody would voluntarily, you know, become a penniless alcoholic if they weren't broken. So it was pretty simple for me to make that conclusion. <laughs> I really appreciate, I thought it was, um, well, you know, I, I should begin by saying, I, this isn't a, a good book to read to get your patriotic groove on. <laughs> if, you, <laughs> if you wanna feel really great about what your country's doing. Um, you know, there's, there's so much good uh, political insight in the book. And in this, I, I'm thinking about the section where you talk about black propaganda versus gray propaganda. Black propaganda being that which has no truth in it and gray propaganda, which has elements of truth uh, among the lies. And it got me thinking about, you know, this work that you did trying to piece your father together from memories of other people and also from your own imagination. And how did you navigate in your search for truth? Um, how did you feel, how trustworthy did you feel the memories were? I'm going to start with the black and gray propaganda because I had never even heard of those terms and I don't know how popular they are, but my dad got his start in espionage in World War II after just traveling to Europe, uh, like many you know, people in my generation did, uh, after graduating in college. And he happened to be at the right place at the right time with uh, speaking French and German fluently. And that's how he, you know, after he enlisted in with the draft in 1941, returned to Europe uh, as, a, as a spy and, and gathering intelligence in, in, in France, where he, he won a medal too, which I wasn't aware of until all of this happened. But, but uh, I guess as someone who 
to get back to the kind of the nut of what you're asking about, as someone who really has no memories of my father, very few, but one I can tell you, and it's in the book here. That's very vivid when I was a young person. But I, I just really, I guess, used the opportunity of diving into the history my dad was involved in to kind of make up my own memories. And I don't, in this, as Krista mentioned in our, in our conversation, I really was on a truth-seeking mission and I wanted to you know, be as honest as I could be in what I was uncovering. At the same time, I just uh, gave myself permission, I guess you could say, in, in imagining different scenes. And, and one of them I, I want to share with you now. It takes place uh, well, it takes place in Beirut, and uh, Beirut really became a tinderbox after in nearby Iraq in 1958. The uh, Iraqi royal family, uh, four four of them, uh, were murdered, and by the Syrian uh, army officer Abdul Karim Qasim, who was a Baathist and was installed in power at that at that time. But the very next year, the U.S. was working on de deposing Qasim, the military leader responsible for the massacre of the Iraqi royal family. A young Saddam Hussein was hired to carry out the dirty work. I found a United Press International article that claims my father knew Hussein. Informed by former U.S. intelligence officials, the article states, during this time, Saddam was making frequent visits to the American embassy where CIA specialists such as Miles Copeland and CIA station chief Jim Eichelberger were in residence and knew Saddam. Reportedly, Hussein botched a 1959 CIA-supported assassination attempt on Qasim when he lost his nerve and fired his gun prematurely, killing the prime minister's driver and only wounding Qasim. Hussein then fled to Syria before landing in Beirut where the CIA installed him in an apartment and provided the 22-year-old with training. It's possible my path crossed Saddam Hussein's. I know it's a sick pastime to imagine association with one of the most brutal tyrants in recent history, but I begin to consider that this is one way to exercise the ghost of my father. I want to vilify my father because of the work he did and how he treated his family. At the same time, I want to find a way to forgive him for the damages he caused. The exorcism now a swing dance of emotion. The rendezvous between Hussein and Ike would have taken place at the St. George's Hotel. Saeed Burj devoted a whole book to the iconic Beirut landmark. In the 1950s and 60s, the indoor bar and terrace restaurant overlooking St. George's Bay was the premier place for spies, journalists, oil men, movie stars, and politicians to congregate. I imagine even roughnecks like Hussein could have come through its doors. A Burrish's father, the decades-long Time magazine bureau chief, set up in an informal shop in the, at the St. George's Bar to keep track of comings and goings. Kim Philby, the double agent, proposed to one of his wives, who at the time was married to a New York Times reporter at the St. George's Bar. And when Philby disappeared and defected to Russia, questions quickly filled the watering hole with speculation. A place where nothing is as it seems is fitting for my flight of fancy. I'm eating a cookie with my dad while my dad is having a drink on the restaurant terrace overlooking the pool and the sea. I adore going out with my dad for sesame to eating cookies. My blonde pixie cut hair is a side ponytail and ribbon and I'm wearing my tan school pinafore that has Anne Mary embroidered in blue cursive across my heart. We're conversing in French about how I like my new school I'm attending when Saddam Hussein walks by, bends in my father's ear for a moment, and whispers a secret. After they're finished talking, my dad and I hold hands for a walk along the corniche. Thank you. I, I really appreciated uh, the way 
you swung between the condemnation of your father and the compassion for your father and I really sensed you trying to find middle ground and you said something towards the end of the book that really interested me you said that your father was your shadow and I wonder if you could tell us more about what you meant by that my father was my I think of my father as my shadow and as another way of saying I have a hole in my heart I have something missing in me and I believe a lot of people I mean it's, it's affected me it's affected me deeply my dad leaving me and I you know I struggle with my own value my self-worth you know confidence a lot of things that I don't think are that uncommon I mean I think a lot of people have or these feelings maybe that hold them back from who they imagine they could be. So I like to think of my shadow, or I've come to think of my shadow as really, an, it's become an invitation for me to kind of step into the light of my own true being, and that's what I've done with this book. My dad lost his voice, and I'm gaining mine. It's amazing. And, and having you all just just to be able to share this experience with you now is like part of that process. But I, w I really want to use this feeling that maybe a lot of other people struggle with, this inadequacy in the face of so many problems that we're facing uh, within our country now, uh, globally, with uh, climate change, which is my, my passion subject. I, I want to just use the opportunity to really uh, serve as some kind of encouragement for other people to embrace their shadow side, you know, whatever's holding them back, so that they then they can really step into what it is that they want to be doing if, if there's something holding them back. I don't know if that's making it's sense to you. It makes <laughs> all the sense in the world. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, and what did you learn about forgiveness in this process? Well, forgiveness is an ongoing process. It's not a one and done. And uh, it's something I think that's really important though. Because if we're gonna move beyond what separates us and the wrongs that have been committed, you know, by you know, you know a lot of unintended consequences. Uh, we have to be able to forgive on so many levels. And I think it's practice. It's something that we, if we practice at it, we'll get better at it. And it, it's an important, a critical step if we're going to um, you know, heal, heal ourselves and uh, heal, heal, heal the culture that we're living in. What, um, what you just said reminded me of another passage in the book, and I want to see if I can uh, get... Well, let me start with this question. What, um, what role does denial play in this story? Well... Denial is a pretty important part of the story in the sense that I ran into it several times. Uh, denial, I discovered, really is a form of protection. It's not something that I believe I practice very much because I like to get to the heart of things and uh, I want to just strip them. But what I saw at least, well, there's a couple of examples I'd like to kind of maybe share from the book, at least one. Uh, that really struck me that it's a form of protection, especially you know for the men that my father worked with, um, you know the horrors that they saw in World War II, particularly. The one story I'm thinking about is a fellow, a good close friend of my father's, named Bob Caldwell. I called him Uncle Bob. He was in the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, like my dad was. And he um, was uh, then got in the ground floor in the CIA, lived in the Middle East like we did. And after my parents split up, uh, we would um, go 
go and I live with my mom in DC, we we go to their house uh, for holidays and so forth. So I kind of looked at him as a you know as another kind of fa father figure. Well, I happened to find in my research a a a interview. It was a transcribed interview that his grandson made uh, of his grandfather about his experiences. And this is really short. I just want to read you this little thing because it it kind of uh, puts into perspective the role of uh, denial. It's just when something is so difficult, people just block it out of their mind. Uh, toward the end of World War II, Bob was in Germany. He oversaw the distribution, uh, oversaw distributing rations to thousands of concentration camp captives who were left near death by the retreating Nazis in the Landsberg concentration camp complex, feeder camps for Auschwitz. On their way to the last stretch of war, the liberating troops who rolled past this sea of starving humanity brought with them their moral fatigue. How could he and his fellow soldiers have become so unsympathetic, Bob wondered. This insensitivity haunted him. I answer him with my thoughts. We become inured by the devastation. This becomes a form of protection. When the army supply train supporting Bob's effort moved on, he pled with the mayor of a nearby town for help. The man who met Bob in full Nazi uniform adamantly denied that such a horror was taking place nearby until my father's friend forcibly took him there to see firsthand the piled bodies of the dead and the barely living emaciates left behind by the retreating Nazis. Denial is also a form of protection, I muse. Thank you. I have a lot more questions, but I want to make sure to allow time for everyone else. And so I think I'd like to open it up and if anyone would like to ask a question or make a contribution and comment, I can come by with the mic to ensure that everyone hears you. Yeah. Okay. 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 Let me give this to you so people can hear. Uh, thank you, um, Anne, for this uh, opportunity to be here and, and, and learn a bit of your history. Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a cliche to say if we. We don't choose our parents, you know, in this case, not fathers, that we live with the consequences of their action or lack thereof. And as someone whose uh, father was absent, not by choice, but um, by mere economic circumstances, his father was absent in his life, I, it took me a while to reconcile with him. And I'm just wondering through this journey, which you have to find through different means, did you reconcile? And how did you do that? And what triggered that reconciliation? What did you find? How did you find that bit of compassion? You know, what what triggered in your life? It's sort of like ah, you know, you, you know what I mean? Yeah, I, I think so. Uh, well, I feel very grateful. I grew up in the generation I did grow up in, and I was a you know I you know I like to say kind of you know cliche like I was a new age hippie chick. I really, uh, you know, Ram Dass's book, Be Here Now, really that kind of w was instrumental in my early teen years. I mean, I did psychedelics, I, I expanded my consciousness, I really understood the connection uh, in a deeply felt manner at an early age, how everything is connected. And so when it came to really uh, reflecting on my life through the process of exploring my dad's, which I've been doing for the past, you know, we start with 2003, it's almost been 20 years, you know, 10 years actively writing the book. I really grew to uh, have a lot of empathy for my father because, I mean, you know, while I was like, whatever, backpacking around South America, you know, enjoying, um, you know, the wonders it had to offer me or, you know, around the Caribbean, which I, which I did right out of high school, you know, my dad was like fighting in a world war and not just fighting, but, uh, you know, having to really use, uh, I mean, really upfront and personal uh, serving the French underground. And I'm sure the horrors that he's experienced, it, it just, it, I think 
you know, trying to give him the benefit of the doubt, which I'd like to give most everybody the benefit of the doubt. Uh, you know, he, he wasn't looking to, uh, you know, become a, you know, a captain of military intelligence. It just is what happened because he was in the right place at the right time. And then I think he probably had a patriotic, uh, you know, calling and I'm not really sure, or maybe a, a sense of adventure because he was on a PhD track at the University of Chicago to get a PhD in, in philosophy. And then Miles Copeland came and recruited him to join him. And I think my dad had a great sense of adventure and this was like exciting too, but maybe there was also a sense that, uh, you know, he was doing something good for his country. I think that probably changed in the long run. <coughs> but long, long way of saying that I, I developed a lot of empathy for my father because what he actually saw. Now, he certainly contributed to it and uh, to a lot of the bad things uh, that our government has done. So he's no innocent bystander, and I, I can't really explain that. But in the end, I think compassion is important, and that trumps just about everything. Anyone else back here? Yeah, I just have a lot your mother. Oh, thank you very much for asking that question. My mother uh, was an artist, and uh, my parents met after the war in, uh, in Chicago, where my mother was a student. She was uh, nine years younger than my dad. She was uh, attending the Art Institute in Chicago. And um, my mom was, uh, you know, a free spirit. That's the way my dad described her, you know, when he was trying to be kind in the letter. That, that part, which was nice, and he, he was attracted to that. Uh, I think he was probably, you know, probably a little more uptight. And, uh, but um, yeah, my mom was very high strung. We had a, um, but I just have so much appreciation for her because my dad did just suddenly leave, and she had, had to move us to Washington D.C. where, and my brother was only, you know, he wasn't even a year old at that point. And she went to school. Um, she didn't even know how to drive. She um, got a job teaching art in the DC public schools, which she did uh, until I, you know, until she retired from there. And we really were able to. So I was a very rebellious teenager. So naturally, she was not very happy with me um, for the growing up years, and I, I can't blame her. <laughs> but she was also, like I said, high strung. So. Um, we had the opportunity to reconcile. As soon as I had my first child, a daughter, I really, I mean, it was becoming a mother that I really understood my mother and what she did for me, even though she had her own problems uh, with alcohol and just anger. And it was misplaced anger, is what I came to understand. So we really reconciled at the end of her life, I'm happy to say. Thanks for asking that. I think we're coming close to the end, but maybe we have time for one more. Ten oh. more minutes? Okay, oh, wow. great. Any other questions or comments? Uh, okay, okay. Here, go ahead. You, you. I can, I can bring you the mic. Thank you. Hi, Ann. Hi, Chris. Um, so there was, I think, a direct quote from Miles Copeland in the book where he said that, that Ike, your father, wrote several articles for the New Yorker. Yeah. And I, I take it that that was, like you said, that he lied a lot or that he made things up or... Well, what did you think? I mean, is it possible that he wrote under a different name or anything like that? Or did, I'm sure you looked for him and didn't I find did, him. I did a general inquiry. I mean, I did find that my dad listed on his... Um, I guess his either it was his draft after you know application or his um, something for you know to travel overseas. He listed his occupation as a, a writer, editor, and reporter. So I do think it's possible he could have written articles for the New Yorker, and I don't know that they'd be under. I, I just don't know how thorough their files are. I, I mean, I made one inquiry. Maybe he did. I, I don't know. It could have been. Miles Copeland was certainly well known for being, uh, you know, an exaggerator or somebody that told him that that's really so. Sorry. That's possible. It's so exciting to get over the truth. Yeah. 
But I imagine that he, uh, you know, if he was, it was probably more whimsical articles about, you know, traveling in, you know, in Europe at, at, you know, at that point in time before the war. Well, he did write the CIA blueprint for um, how to be a, a dictator and stay there. Uh, yeah, yeah. The one thing that my dad gets credit for, and it's awful. I mean, that, that you know, this, uh, he, he disassociated, um, I think it was titled The Power Problems of a Revolutionary Government. It was kind of blueprint about how you need to have your secret police and, uh, you know, you know, you had to take whatever means necessary to keep a grip on that power. Uh, something that supposedly he disassociated himself from later in his life as not being something he'd want his name associated with. So I guess he had some kind of reconciliation. Mm -hmm. I, again, if you believe Miles Copeland, this is all from Miles Copeland, who was, like I said, known to be an exaggerator at best and, a, and an outright liar at worst. Question? A comment about it before my question. He also wrote the Surgeon General's report on smoking and wanted to write a book about how smoking was good for you. <laughs> so he was a complex man, a very proud man. I met him a few times. But uh, my question is explain the title of the book, please. It gets by the interest. Well, thank you, Richard, for that question. Uh, a good spy leaves no trace. Well, I love double entendres, so to me, uh, this is a double entendre in the sense that my dad, I mean, you know, if you are in intelligence or if you're a spy, you really are supposed to have a light print, footprint. Nobody's supposed to know what you're doing. And so you certainly shouldn't be leaving a trace. And so that's where really the kind of the fundamental meaning of that comes for me and uh, in the sense my dad didn't leave much of a trace I mean he was writing these 500 pages and that I was definitely going to get a copy of that I never got a copy of and he would write about this in a number of his letters so I guess I know he was a good spy All right, well. Um, it's, it's interesting that you, <laughs> this first time I've heard the association of Saddam Hussein and, uh, and the CIA because this is floated in this, this sort of I don't know, conspiracy, if you will, floated in Lebanese literature and Egyptian literature for some time. You know, I remember reading about it way back. Okay. Yeah, well, it was, I mean, this book is really well footnoted. <laughs> I had like, like a, almost like 180 some footnotes. Anyways, that was a UPI article that you can, Patrick Saleh wrote. He was a big Middle East reporter back in the day. Uh, so that's what he says. Thank you. Well, thank you everybody for coming uh, out. Oh, well, other, we're, we've got some more, okay, sorry. I was just gonna ask, were there other children who were affected by this uh, configuration of your mother, your father, his second, his second partner. Do you want to say anything about the other uh, children in the scene? Uh, yes. Uh, oh, well, we never even got to that part. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> That's that okay. Uh, yeah, my dad, I mean, one of the things that kind of blew apart, you know, uh, when we were in Beirut and my dad left my mom was that he ended up having an affair with his partner's wife who had eight children. Uh, one of those children I was in pretty close touch with uh, while I was writing the book she wasn't very happy with me writing the book so I've changed the name actually so uh, it, it, this this kind of trauma really affects what I've become empathetic to it really affects people differently whereas I want to just dig deeper the kind of get to the light of the you know of, of the trauma I guess because I think that there's a you know it's good to go through it and try to understand it uh, many many other people probably maybe more people than people like me uh, just want to put it behind them and uh, that's my understanding of uh, the way those other children they really don't want anything to do with me I just want to get to the light of it
mm-hmm. you don't want me talking about my father the way I am. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, sure. I thought that was so Thank you. I, I was so hopeful that like we could become spirit sisters because my dad lived with her mom until her mom died. And um, I mean, when they finally left the Middle East, which was 1967, they settled not far, you know, an hour from, uh, a little over an hour from where my mom lived. And I did meet her, uh, the, the girlfriend, the, and, and then the daughter, like I looked her up. And she, she, well, she also took care of my dad when he was dying. And uh, she let me know that my dad was dying and asked me to come to his hospital, but I, I didn't at the time, because at the time my dad died. And he, was, he wasn't a part of my life and I had other things I was doing. Uh, so I just, I guess naturally thought that we would grow into these kind of spirit sisters and the, the exact opposite happened. And they couldn't be further from She ever heard that I wrote this book? She, I don't know what she did. <laughs> well, I. Well, I think her trauma was worse than mine. Yeah. Way worse. Yeah. You, yeah. So. You wrote that very well. Yeah. So. It's understandable. Like I said, denying. You know, a lot of denial is a. Yes, denial is not just a river in Egypt. <laughs> okay, well, I want to thank everyone for coming out. I think we need to let Flyleaf folks, um, but I, I'm sure there's time to purchase books and talk to Anne, so we've got a little more of that time. But thank you, everybody, and congratulations. Thank you. So much for coming um, and for purchasing a book um, that helps us keep going. And also, if you are interested in more events, you can check out our weekly newsletter or our website. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. I wanted to also mention that uh, we're going to dinner at uh, Luce Tigre. We've reserved a bunch of picnic tables outside. So, any of you all that have the time and haven't eaten dinner and want to join us, uh, please stick around because that's where we're going to be. Now we get here.